Record. Okay, we're live. Hey, Sina, you're here. How's hey guys, it going? how are you? Welcome to another episode. Welcome to another episode. Yeah, today we're going to talk about dollar shortage. Um, everything is crashing, Sina. What's happening? Uh, we have the dollar skyrocketing to its highest price since 20 years against major other currencies. Um, I will share my screen with you so you can have a look and uh, we can talk about this in more detail maybe because uh, it seems like there is some liquidity problem in the market. And um, I think it's important that we talk about the mechanisms behind this and for people to understand why exactly is this happening? Why are, why is everything going down against the dollar? And what is exactly causing this? And how has this historically uh, played out? Um, can you see the chart? Um, my system is a, a bit slow right oh, now. Wait, but I wait, guess wait. Now. Wait, wait a second, wait a second. Uh, wait a second. The guys on Clubhouse only can hear me, but now they should be able to hear you. Can you Hello? say something? Hello? Yeah, yeah, now, okay. now you're coming through. Okay, can, can you see my chart? Um, I'm just having a technical problem on my side, but uh, you go ahead, yeah. Okay, no worries. So. Uh, the, the thing is that the, the dollar index, which is basically an index that uh, puts the US dollar against the major other world currencies in the world, specifically, uh, I think the highest weight in that index is the euro, has reached its highest point since 2002. And the main reason, of course, is because the world is indebted mostly in dollars. And when there is a liquidity problem and there is a lot of debt in the system and the Fed comes out and says, we're going to increase the interest rate by 50 basis points, um, then you have an issue. And the issue is that everyone who owes anyone in dollars needs dollars. So they have to either get the dollars by selling assets or they have to borrow new dollars. And that's the reason everything is going down against the dollar. Every asset stock market is down tremendously. The NASDAQ is down. The S&P is down. The S&P has reached its lowest point uh, since March 21. It has fallen against the dollar. Uh, let me see. As you can see here, it's, 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 it has crashed almost 20% now, uh, which is quite a lot for the S&P. It is huge, actually. Uh, it's the biggest move ever since... COVID. So um, it remains to be seen how the Fed will react. And the problem right now is that no investor can tell how the Fed will react and when they will react. Because the entire system depends on 12 people literally sitting in a room and deciding what move they're going to take next in order to stabilize the economy which is highly fragile and it's it's quite scary but um i think it's quite reasonable to zoom out at this point and you know look at this from a very 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 long term perspective and um see what the us dollar has been doing in the past 50 years and 60 years versus how the dollar has been doing in the past three months. Maybe you want to talk about that. Um, so can you hear me okay? 
we can hear you perfectly fine yes okay yeah um, all right so yeah i guess uh, maybe i'd like to first i guess go ahead and talk a little bit about what uh what is driving these uh, dollar shortage issues and what it means basically <clears throat> So I want to go back uh, a long time to early uh, 20th, 21st century, uh, 20th century, where, uh, you know, we were on the gold standard and it had the benefit of enforcing brutal discipline in financial flows. So if you always had to settle in gold, uh, <clears throat> you had to have the money for every transaction rather than borrowing. And uh, um, this forced uh, significant discipline in managing credit and, uh, um, and, and financial stability. But people faced an issue at that point where uh, brutal discipline could also mean that certain transactions cannot be done unless your cash flows are supporting it. Uh, and if you're if you're expecting your customer to pay you in a, in in the next month, but today you want to strike a deal and you know get into a mutually beneficial transaction with another party, um, if you want to do away with any sort of credit, if there's no credit, you can't do this. You have to wait until you get paid. You get paid next month and then start business then. Well, this might not seem like a big problem, but this means that an investment that could be done today has to be delayed till next month, right? So this mm -hmm. creates some sort of financial friction. And just because there is no money or money is delayed, uh, economic progress will be hampered, right? So this wasn't really working well um, when we were not able to manage uh, financial flows in a, in a nice way. So people decided to, uh, you know, fall back on credit and, uh, and, and, and DPEG from the, the gold so that you have you can freely issue new money to support financial transactions, right? So this seems you know, working very well in theory. Uh, and then so, so the way it should work is you expand the money supply when there's shortage of uh, some kind of currency, but afterwards you contract the money supply uh, when the production has happened so you pay back your debt and you don't get into this constant state of uh, growing debt. But uh, of course, people found ways to gain this system because fiat is backed by literally nothing. Uh, and we allowed banks and central banks to print uh, money out of thin air. Uh, they discovered that actually, once you have that printer, there's no need to you know, paying to pay back the debt, just issue new debt to pay the previous debt, okay? Do follow this process for a century, a hundred years, and you will get a system where you have a growing amount of credit and debt in the system. No one repays debt. You just repay it with new debt. You just basically refinance. And, and this gets us into this condition where everyone is indebted to another person, everyone's income is somebody else's debt, everyone's assets are actually someone else's debt. And this was something that Russia um, understood uh, uh, brutally felt earlier this year. Uh, any kind of asset you think is yours is actually some other government's liability, right? And everything depends on everything else. So we have created this entangled complex system where a failure in one, uh, one part would lead to um, debt issues, liquidity issues, lack of, you know, failure to repay the debt. If you can't pay your debt, somebody else whose income depends on your repayment will, will fail as well. All of their customers and, and, and creditors will, will fail as well. So you get this uh, debt and liquidity death spiral, spiral which uh, is to be avoided at all costs by central banks. So they have entered into this uh, dangerous game of ever expanding credit, okay? And then if, if in one part of the system, we see a failure like we saw in 2008 in the housing market, we see a failure if some parts of the economy start to um, go bankrupt and they have credit and, and, and collateral issues, 
then every other part will be impacted and suddenly credit will collapse and the financial system will, will, will hit a sudden stop. Um, you will see massive uh, layoffs and most of the burden will be on, on the lower um, uh, sections of the income pyramid, right? So the weaker people will be impacted more. So that's something all governments try to avoid. How do you avoid that? As soon as you start feeling uh, some kind of stress in the collateral, and, 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 the, and the credit market, mm -hmm. uh, you inject some money into the system. Now, if you have this uh, um, omniscient, omnipotent, powerful, uh, uh, extremely uh, analytical and intelligent Federal Reserve System who would exactly know where to in inject liquidity, uh, then they would be able to kind of do away with, with these problems and, and in a limited way and in a micro, in a surgical manner, fix the problem where it happens and uh, avoid it, avoid a contagion into other pieces, other places. But, uh, but of course they can't do this. So instead the policies they have allows them to uh, uh, print a ton of money and distribute it everywhere rather than trying to surgically target the areas where you have liquidity issues. They, they create this flood of liquidity that covers everywhere, every person, every market, every asset. And that's how they've been trying to avoid these liquidity death spirals, right? And, and the problem with that is, you know, you have a small problem somewhere to fix that. You, you use a significantly larger um, uh, stimulus and solution, right? So naturally, every time you're trying to fix one of these problems, it gets even worse. It's like it's like putting make gas. It worse. Yeah, it's like putting putting gasoline into 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 fire, right? Like you put you put gasoline into fire uh, in order to stop the fire, but instead you actually make it worse every time you do so. It's like subsiding fire with fire. Yes, precisely. Yeah, that's a good uh, way to put it. Out, thank you for the comments. I just had a to eat and invited uh, the community to join the room. So please, uh, I just used a, some sort of trick to invite them um, to uh, get familiar with the respective concepts of the cryptocurrency and its issues, uh, especially that uh, particularly since we had the same topic in the previous room. So please let the, uh, let the com conversation go a little bit fluent and simplify. Thank you. Sure. So, uh, uh... I think uh, something that we talked about, Sina, in the previous room, which uh, I find very, very helpful for a lot of people to uh, make them understand this better, is to talk about this bubble uh, that has a lot of air in it, right? So that's when we talk about inflation, that's actually, you can imagine this bubble being inflated with a lot of air, right? So at some point, this bubble is so large that if quite naturally, what this bubble wants to do based on uh, the free market, it wants to deflate. Why does it want to deflate? Because nature is deflationary right? Nature, which is the economy, the free market is part of nature. Uh, human choices are deflationary. Everyone wants to pay less and uh, everyone is always looking to be more efficient. Everyone is looking to spend less time and make more money, right? That's the choice of every human being on this planet. Every day, of the year always has been. So quite naturally on the free market, everyone's choices are deflationary choices because no one wants to do uh, more and earn less. That's inflationary, right? So what happens is in the, in the free market, if you let the, this bubble that you have created, if you let it alone and stop printing more debt, the, the free market will cause this to deflate. And when this deflationary effect happens, exactly what we're witnessing right now happens. Everything relative to the dollar starts to crash 
Why? Because everyone is owed money to everyone else and everyone needs to repay them in dollars. And since dollars are now more expensive because the Federal Reserve has increased the interest rates, everyone has to sell anything that they have in order to pay everyone back. So quite naturally, what it causes is, is it causes this deflationary temporary moment. However, if we look at all the, all the fiat currencies in the world today, and this is something I was telling you about in the previous room, is that if we look at every single one of them, I think there is around 50 to 60 uh, currencies today, national currencies today, right? So if we look at the most successful one of them, this is actually, I, I, I'm, I've borrowed this from Michael Saylor. He puts it very, very well. The most successful uh, uh, currency today is the US dollar, right? Compared to any other national currency. And the US dollar has lost more than 99% of its value in the past 60 years. Think about it. The most successful currency we have has lost already over 99% of its value compared to everything else. So we know the end game of this. It's just going to increase the, the, the devaluation or the, um, the devaluation of the dollar must increase because of this debt problem. The question is not if, the question is when. And these deflationary short periods are nothing new. This is something I was, uh, um, I, was, I was gathering from another podcast I was listening to the other day. Um, they typically last about maximum 12 to max, max, maximum 24 months. I think the longest deflationary period we've ever had with the dollar was in the Great Depression in 1929. That was two years, okay? But that's it. The longest ever after that was only 12 months. So uh, people need to understand we are still in a very inflationary period. And what we are witnessing right now is a deflationary short-term shock. And that's normal. This is what happens when inflation starts to peak, you will have bumps on the road. So... You shouldn't fall for it. Um, and Sina has a beautiful chart that he can share with us. Um, I think maybe you want to talk about it yourself, Sina. It, I, I'm talking about the gold chart versus the German um, Reismark. Basically, the Germans went through the exact same uh, time, which was a inflationary and later on a hyperinflationary time almost precisely 100 years ago. And during the inflationary period, first of all, it took a long time. It didn't happen uh, overnight, right? These things take time. They take typically five to seven years to completely um, unfold, all right? So on this path, there is a lot of volatility. That's completely normal. So a lot of people fall for it and think, oh my God, the dollar is now going up or the German mark was going up against the, 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 the gold at that time, but eventually it collapsed against gold quite naturally because there, there was so much uh, debt uh, reparations of the German government and they had to pay the British and the, Fran and the French for all the uh, uh, debt obligations and they had to print a lot of money. And essentially, when the market, the free market started to finally spend all the excess reserves of, of, of savings and velocity started to pick up, inflation came later and then it went hyper up. And during that time, you have this periods of very volatile moves. Yeah, so um, on top of the... Uh clubhouse room you could see a link to a telegram channel that's big guys channel so uh, we got a channel and then that's linked to a discussion group where anyone can have uh if you know any question about bitcoin uh we will answer that uh, 
uh, anytime we uh, anytime uh, we are available. So that's uh, that's a good resource. But if you go to the Telegram channel, you can see I posted a, a graph, uh, actually two graphs. One is the progression of Turkish lira against dollar, and then the other one is. Uh, what happened to gold price in uh, during the hyperinflation of Germany, which uh, Arke was just talking about. Um, and the, the idea is the, during the inflation, a lot of people would be like, yeah, it's, you know, it's super simple trade. I understand that there is going to be inflation. I, I understand that people are going to print a lot of money and then gold price will go up. So I'll buy a lot of it and then I'll get rich. But most people didn't do it. And the reason for that is uh, markets are brutally volatile in that uh, environment. If you look at the if you look at the gold price uh, in Mark, uh, you see massive uh, volatility, massive spikes, which probably attracts a lot of people to the asset, and then immediate crashes uh, to very low levels, which kind of uh, attracts a lot of people to the mark, back to Mark, thinking, "Oh my God, Mark is has done has bottomed, and then now tides are changing. So let's go back to the fiat currency." Well, of course, uh, only to see that uh, gold uh, picks up again. So uh, a lot of people who try to sort of time the market in this environment got burned, <clears throat> and <clears throat> and. Uh, couldn't make it to the end till the end, right? So it's important to understand the end game, but it's also very important to strategize in a way that you can actually see the end, right? Uh, for example, uh, if anyone like got leverage, borrowed any money to buy a gold to somehow outperform gold in this environment, you can imagine what could have happened to them. Um, uh, in the volatility, same thing happens to a lot of people who, uh, you know, understand Bitcoin, but then try to get leverage to outperform the market. Then they suddenly see, oops, you know, 60, 70% crash in the price. How did this happen? Right. So uh, it's very important that long term trends are, are hardly predictable on a short term basis. They kind of fool a lot of people and confuse a lot of people. Uh, if you want to have, uh, if you want to outperform the market, if you want to time the market and predict price trajectory, you will get burned. Bitcoin is always, you know, always surprises people. One of the biggest surprises was just recently when uh, a lot of people were expecting a, a cycle top, a blow off top at the end of the cycle. Instead, it actually reversed course and entered a bear market without uh, showing signs of having topped at all. Uh, people were comparing Bitcoin price, price action to the previous cycles and everyone just got uh, a, a rude awakening, right? Another chart we have there is uh, Turkish Lira. You know, we were discussing this and we were following what's happening to Erdogan's uh, irresponsible uh, monetary policies. Uh, he was, you know, printing money left and right, reducing interest rate to stimulus the economy while the currency was uh, declining. Um, uh, Icarus was mentioning that before to us. So thank you very much for pointing that out. Uh, and, and so the expectation was that Turkish lira would decline. And you can see it did for a while, but then it kind of topped out and, and uh, uh, in increased in value, right? So at that point, I clearly remember a lot of people were like, you know, a lot of people in Turkey were like, you know, this is, uh, the trend has stopped and reversed. So let's uh, uh, invest, quote unquote, in Turkish Liras because it's appreciating so fast. And of course, after a while, um, we went back to trend and fundamentals prevailed. And since then, we have been in this steady process of, a decline in the value of Turkish lira. So this is very important. Uh, if you start to see a long-term trend that a lot of people also see, you could see a huge flock of uh, speculators enter the market. They create a massive price spike. 
And once uh, it has run its course, it reverses, leads to a severe crash, but nothing has changed in the fundamentals. Fundamentals will ultimately take, uh, take back the driver's seat and, and keep things moving. Uh, again, same thing's happening to Bitcoin. You know, we have this underlying process where fiat is depreciating, Bitcoin is appreciating against them, but also due to its network effects. Uh, but you don't see this positive effect when you're in a bear market. We are still in a phase where speculators and tourists and short-term thinkers are uh, looking for the doors, but they will end. You know, we just have so many of them, right? Once everyone has sold out, you will see the, the uh, fundamental trend taking, you know, long-term trend taking um, control again, and, and you would see... Uh, another cycle of short-term uh, players that come in and speculate and bid up the price and cause crashes while the fundamental is still working quietly. So if you understand this dynamics, you actually love the bear markets uh, because that allow you to accumulate. But uh, most people fear bear markets and they want to sell in those times. So be very careful. Fall back on your long-term thinking and long-term thesis. Uh, rather than trying to follow the price. Price has been declining in the past. A lot of people project that and thinking, oh, it will can keep declining in the future. So it's maybe a good time to sell. Uh, what, I can sell what I can say is uh, don't make rash decisions. At the same time, you're in a very volatile environment. Financial markets are highly fragile as we are seeing with uh, what's happening with the dollar. So uh, everyone should also expect volatile moves in either direction and plan accordingly. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it's quite interesting what you uh, have put there with the chart. I'm looking at it right now, and um, it is fascinating if you think that this same thing happened to gold, right, during the Weimar time. And you have price swings of above 80%, right? 80% uh, ups and downs versus the German mark. Uh, obviously, we have to mention that this is a different environment. We don't live in the 1920s anymore. There is much more debt in the system. Uh, the world is a much more globalized world. We don't have one nation at play here like Germany was. On that chart, we have um, basically the entire world this time uh, on the plate. So the game is way more serious. It's uh, way more dangerous. And um, it's, yeah, I mean... As you said, Sina, I think during these times, it always makes sense to come back to the fundamentals and understand what wins over time, right? If we look at the um, Turkish Lira chart, uh, you always have these short-term price swings, but at the end of the day, it's always the same rule. The weak currency falls versus the stronger currency, always, always. Why? Very simple, supply and demand. If the supply of the currency is higher than the supply of its next big, biggest competitor, right? Then obviously it will go down in value versus the other currency. It's that simple. And if, if you go through that chain, you will find that the market always converges on one single monetary medium, which is the strongest medium. The biggest winners in the market, in, in the money market, are the forms of networks that no one or at least almost no one can influence the supply. If you look at gold, the reason gold won over any other currency in the world or form of money in the world was because it became harder over time to produce it. And I mean, there was other reasons because of 
its fungibility and stuff. That was also the reasons we talk about that. Uh, you talk about that in your course, obviously. If anyone is interested, go check out the course of C Nights on our website at bitguide.io so you can learn more about the history of money. But my point is that over time, uh, everything goes down versus the strongest asset or the strongest currency in this case. And it is hard to see on a short-term basis, but on a long-term basis, it's just, it's just logic. It's very, very logical. Um, if there is demand for a certain asset and someone can influence the supply of that asset, then obviously that someone is going to increase that or that group of people is going to increase that supply once there is more demand. Well, if you learn about Bitcoin, you find out that no matter how much demand there is, even if demand goes up, even if demand for Bitcoin reaches hundreds of billions of people, the supply of it can never go up ever. It has a hard cap supply. And that is not true with any other asset in the world. That is why... Exactly. That is why the Turkish lira is losing against the dollar over the long term. And the US dollar, which is right now the leading currency versus all the other currencies, is losing against Bitcoin over time. May I Absolutely. So as you're... Exp Go ahead. Go ahead. Right. Yeah, okay. Uh, we have just talked about why is it significant and essential to understand um, the concept of money, which is controlled by the governments. Let's talk about uh, Turkey, okay? Mr. Erdogan is no fool to devaluate its currency on purpose. Why he has done it, why he has jeopardized uh, the national resource, which definitely belongs to Turkish people. Let's say, I, I think I, we talked about uh, this issue with Sina uh, a couple of months ago. Well, the fact is, he was aware about what's going on, about this problem regarding Nord Stream first and second, about uh, those uh, natural resources, I mean, gas, natural gas, which was providing from Russia to Europe. And what happened uh, regarding Turkish Lira, uh, I mean, uh, devaluating Turkish Lira uh, against uh, other currencies was, he was trying to replace those uh, resources which had been discovered recently, I mean, a couple of years ago in Turkey. So, Europe could pay less euros to purchase these, um, let's say, natural gases and other things. Okay, this is how the governments use their control over the over the money. I mean, monetary policies and financial policies to jeopardize the natural resources which belongs to a nation. Okay, so if we can understand, I mean, what Arki say, fundamentally understand what is going on about the money, um, about the control of the central banks and the governments over the money, it will help us to realize what is going on um, in a bigger picture. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's very hard because uh, most people are short-term sighted. And uh, obviously, usually, uh, this is a job of uh, professional investors. But since no one can save uh, any more money anymore, everyone has to deal with this problem right now because banks have uh, pretty much destroyed their, the savings accounts of the average person. So everyone is going through this issue right now, everywhere in the world. No one can save dollars, euros, Japanese yen, um, British pound, uh, Turkish lira, toman, rial, whatever. 
because of this issue. And it's a systematic problem and it requires a lot of education because this is not taught in schools. This is not taught anywhere in, in uh, I mean, not, not a single Keynesian economist is going to teach you about these problems. Why? Because their entire systematic learning concepts is based on the idea of inflation being good for the economy right? Because they say inflation is causing more growth and therefore it's good. Well, as you can see right now in front of our faces, this is the evidence that they're wrong. Again, after hundreds of times we've seen in history that this theory is flawed. You can have high inflation and less growth or even worse growth or absolutely no growth. We can see that right now. So there's been, I don't know in the past, I mean, I've studied a lot about this topic. I'm not sure if there's been any period in recent history where you had an inflationary period and the Federal Reserve was tightening. That's, 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 that's nuts. That's, this is insane that they are increasing interest rates into an inflationary environment because usually they have to, they're forced to, or they, 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 they should, according to their own concepts of, of economics, they, they, they have to ease money or they have to make money cheaper if there is an economic problem or there is less growth. But apparently they're contradicting themselves because right now they're not doing that. We have no growth and um, we have high inflation and they're tightening. <laughs> and that's Crazy. because, that's because, you know, the economic models do not include politics in them for the most part, right? And that's... Uh, significant shortfall when they design it in the ideal world they think okay there would be this smart person on top of the system who has all the data and they can make the best decisions and okay so then that's my model that's what follows of course they don't consider the fact that uh, things can get political when you when you centralize a global um, resource and and you give it to a small number of people to decide um, it turns into a political battle. Everyone wants to get access to that source of control, so they will have all kinds of influences on that um, on that power. Right now, they are more thinking about inflation and votes uh, rather than uh, actually supporting the economy. So you brought up a lot of good points. Uh, one of them is like you know going back to the first discussion we had in the beginning of the session. Uh, that the credit-based fiat system has to grow indefinitely, right? Credit has to expand, otherwise it will implode. So it's inherently unstable. And as they keep expanding and expanding and expanding, they solve temporary problems. Um, they solve the medium of exchange problems. They, they solve liquidity problems by printing a ton of money. But in doing that, they destroy a store of value function for the money. So anyone using that fiat will just not have the ability to store uh, the value of their labor in a reliable manner. So they kind of destroy that function. They, they disable money's a store of value function. And they are also, uh, you know, most people also can't uh, invest in gold and that's why we have so much paper, gold uh, on the markets. So essentially, people are deprived of the ability to store value without having to speculate and gamble and become a hedge fund on their own, right? And that's exactly we are trying to take back with Bitcoin, where it's like, you know, even if you want to run this uh, uh, an elastic currency on top of Bitcoin, there must be some sound money at the base this standard must be something sound that doesn't expand. Uh, gold was fine, but uh, Bitcoin is much better. Uh, 
several orders of magnitude better. So this allows us to, this combination between some sort of an elastic currency and Bitcoin would allow people to keep, um, um, keep storing the value of their labor in a, in a sound manner, but also tr still keep going with the uh, with the shortages that we see in, in certain pockets in the economy until ultimately we you know, break away from this madness of uh, ever expanding credit in the system. So that's, that's very, very important. At the base of the system, we need some sort of sound, sound money, which we don't have at the moment. And that's, this has created lots of moral hazard. All, anyone that has access to expansion of money supply indefinitely, indefinitely does so, much more than economists and their models predict because there's also a lot of politics um, involved. Um, and uh, interestingly, a lot of these discussion is hidden because, you know, uh, when, you are an, uh, when you are trying to get a, a, a grant to study something about economics, uh, grants mostly come from government institutions, and then that, of course, means the results of your research can never be that governments are inefficient and ineffective in managing money money supply. So that's one, and then I want to go back to our this to to our core topic, which was uh, appreciation of the dollar. So I'm going to post two more charts on the Big Guide uh, Telegram channel. Again, you can find the link to the channel on top of the uh, clubhouse room. So, of course, as you can see, you know, DXY is rising. And something we need to add to the previous discussion is this is kind of a short squeeze on, on everyone in the world, right? As dollar goes up, a lot of people find it uh, difficult to pay back debt. Uh, many countries and institutions in the world have dollar-denominated debt, but they have uh, income and cash flow in their own currency. So when when dollar goes up, uh, credit uh, becomes tight, and then you can't you can't easily pay back. You probably have to sell some collateral. S selling the collateral um, uh, has the effect of you know accelerating because you sell it and then the price uh, goes down, that causes other participants in the market to also have trouble with their, their collateral. As collateral value goes down, you have to post more collateral uh, or get liquidated basically. And that creates this uh, spiral of uh, uh, liquidity issues and bankruptcies and liquidations. And, so, and, and a local problem can quickly become a global problem, right? The, the odds of that goes up in an exponential manner as dollar price goes up. So that's why everybody is very uh, scared about uh, and worried about this uh, DXY rise. And it's not just DXY, any sort of, it's supposed to be a basket, but it's kind of skewed towards Euro. But if you look at US dollar versus Japanese yen, um, and interestingly, Chinese yuan, um, same, same things happening, significant uh, appreciation of the dollar against all kinds of other currencies, which is a sign of a stress in the credit market. So a lot of people have to sell other assets to buy the dollars, right? So that's why you see the price of dollar goes up. To confirm what we're saying, if you look at the interest rates, if you look at the bond yields, yields uh, so bonds are the, one of the most liquid assets. So if you have trouble paying back your debt, uh, one of the best ways to go to go to is uh, your treasury, and and if you have uh, some allocation to bonds, which uh, uh, many many institutions have, actually the bond market is uh, significantly larger than the stock market, and they will people try to sell sell bonds and when you do that obviously yields should go up and that's exactly what we see yields are are uh, significantly up in the last few months another confirmation of this credit stress is the the second chart i've posted on the channel and that's something uh, i took from fred federal oh, reserves yeah i was uh, about to ask you yeah. about that sorry yeah go ahead yeah. So what is this telling? This is basically comparing two important economic factors. Uh, we are looking at interest rate on reserve balances, 
the blue line. Uh, this mm -hmm. is how much money you can get if you park your cash with the Federal Reserve. So I have some excess cash as a, like a bank, right? So I have excess reserves. And then I, uh, what do I do with it? I, I loan it to Federal Reserve and they give me some uh, interest on it. Right now it's at 0.9%. 0.9%. Um, now, if you look at four-week treasuries, that's the shortest duration treasuries, um, these trade at uh, 0.5 or something like that, 0.5%. That's their, that's their rate uh, or the yield you can get. So, are you so if you have access to Federal Reserve to park your cash, park your reserves, and get 0.9%, why would you ever at any in any condition try to buy treasuries with which pay you less? So that's kind of seems like a stupid decision for a bank to try to buy treasuries instead of parking their money in Federal Reserve. So this distance or difference that we at this at the moment we see between uh, uh, IRR, uh, which is interest rate on reserves, and then the four-week treasury uh, yield, this difference is very interesting and it's an important economic indicator. I, I borrowed this idea from uh, Jeff Snyder. Uh, if you if you follow him, is very he's uh, uh, a very high signal person. In, in, in finance. So what is this what this is telling us is first of all, what we should see is the treasury bill to be exactly trading at or above the interest rate on reserves. Some are close because uh, if there's any difference, arbitrage arbitrage should close the gap. but but it's not happening. The reason for that is, a lot of people in the financial markets are buying short-term treasury bills as collateral. And that's, that causes treasury bills to be much more attractive than parking cash at a Federal Reserve. So this huge gap from 0.9 to 0.5 is indicative of collateral shortage in the system. A lot of banks and financial institutions are trying to hoard the treasury bills, short-term, very, very short-term treasury bills to then use them as collateral rather than parking their cash with the Federal Reserve. Um, this is uh, an important sign showing stress in the system as well. So combine DXY at 20 year high, uh, so, treasury short term bills significantly so not, lower than so the not, reserve let rates. Me, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a follow up question on that. So what you're saying is that because of this instabilities, the pressure is proportionately increasing on the Federal Reserve to act, right? So what this all means is, uh, like you said, system is showing signs of fragility. Um, and, and this is kind of a gradually at first and then suddenly situation. As you get squeezed and squeezed, uh, it's just a matter of time until you see an, ex an implosion somewhere and, and it will most likely be some kind of you know, emerging market or some other place uh, um, going underwater. And then that starts quickly expanding uh, around the world. That's when you, you will see Federal Reserve have to you know, stop quantitative tightening. And uh, basically that's what they do. They tighten, tighten, tighten and they don't know how much is not is needed. You ask uh, uh, Jerome Powell, he's like, you know, we, we don't know what rate is good. We just, uh, we will just get you to the neutral rate. And the way to understand neutral rate is, is we tighten until something breaks, until somebody big goes bankrupt, until, until some, something big, uh, some kind of implosion happens in the credit system. And that would be the sign. That's what I'm saying. Like as soon as you see some major bankruptcies or some some kind of uh, big uh, credit problems happening in the world, that's the point at which Federal Reserve has absolutely no choice other than going back to stopping QT yeah. at least. 
Yeah, but yeah. that would be the extreme situation, right? I mean, uh, of course, this does not account for any political pressures that they would act way earlier. The, the fact of the matter is uh, to predict when they will act is very, very, very hard uh, time-wise. But to predict that they will eventually act is, uh, I would say, very, very certain. <laughs> uh, I would say 100% certain at this stage. Uh, there is nothing 100%. Obviously, there's uh, nothing is absolutely certain. But uh, I don't believe that the Federal Reserve of the United States is going to let the entire world collapse. That's not going to happen. So they are going to uh, step in in latest by that time, how Sina just described. But uh, I could imagine that there is going to be a lot of political pressure uh, right before that or even way before that, that they will act. But the fact of the matter is we just don't know. We don't know. This is, uh, a, this, this is why fiat sucks because it depends on the judgment of just a few people. And there is no, you can, you can see this is the evidence. There, nothing is priced in the free market anymore. It all depends on the Federal Reserve and how they will react. Usually, supply and demand of goods and services in an economy should price things. But as you can see, that's not the case in our monetary system. It all depends how much more debt is going to be pumped into the system or how tight debt currently is. Um, this is just the way things are at the moment. It's uh, probably going to get, not probably, it's most certainly it's going to get just worse from, from this point of time. And um, that is why you need to really consider to have at least some position in Bitcoin because Bitcoin lets you exit and have a position outside of this madness, right? So completely uncorrelated to its price to the dollar, Bitcoin is completely outside of the realm of any human judgment. There is no decision making on its monetary policy issues. It's programmatically fixed and it's predetermined and no one can change it. That is why you need, I mean, I guess anyone listening, um, some people might be all in Bitcoin, but the majority of people are not. And if you have no Bitcoin at all during this time, this is your time to have at least some Bitcoin because if shit hits the fan, you really want to be able uh, to have something outside of this madness. See, at this point, like oh. two, two, there are two possibilities. One of them is this death uh, spiral goes out of hand and and uh, accelerates and Federal Reserve doesn't act enough so they over tighten and uh, we see a financial crisis um, at that point they will uh, have to devalue the currency and pump all the markets so at, so, so Bitcoin will go up after an initial flash crash the other possibility is they come to the rescue early on and they start pumping uh, quickly, uh, which also means all the assets and Bitcoin will, will pump. So, you know, however you look at it, uh, over midterm, right now, the risk reward is very positive on owning Bitcoin. And essentially, Bitcoin is your insurance against collapse of fiat right so if the if we fall into some kind of uh significant inflation inflationary situation uh you want bitcoin if not you will you can guarantee you, you are basically uh basically there's no no way these governments can pay back their debt without expanding money supply anyways um so and that's also bullish for bitcoin uh, however you look at it, it's uh, it's a very strong risk reward, but you have to know that volatility is also really uh, important and, and high. So you can't you can never 
uh, kind of use leverage to outperform what's happening. Uh, that's something I want to caution people against. Icarus, I think you had a comment. Yeah. Please. Uh, regarding Federal Reserve current policy, uh, I believe the first priority right now is to avoid um, the inflation moves from crippling inflation into walking inflation. Um, the first um, priority, I, I think it's not fighting against the inflation itself, but uh, the problem is the evolving, the process of evolving crippling inflation into a constant form of inflation called, um, let's say, walking inflation and uh, emerging, uh, let's say, high uh, inflationary expectation among the people. Meanwhile, we have, um, I mean, uh, the problem between Ukraine and Russia is still going on. We have the COVID restrictions. Uh, so, mm, I believe that this process and what we are expecting about, uh, let's say, something like stagflation or something like you know, bursting the bubble, um, we have a long, long, a long way to go to, to that point. Uh, I think the priority is to avoid walking inflation. And yeah, for sure. That's it. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I think you have a good point there. But you know, um, the, the the problem is that inflation is not only caused by monetary policy. It's it it ca it's caused by two aspects. One is monetary inflation, uh, but the other aspect is velocity. This is something that the Keynesians don't understand. I, if you increase the money supply, uh, you cannot influence the velocity of the money supply so if the psychology and velocity is 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 a human psychologic free market phenomenon where people choose to either spend or save right and if people are saving then there is of course no velocity if if they're not spending they there there is very very low velocity and if there is low velocity uh, obviously you're not going to reach a high number in uh, terms of inflation, depending on what you put in the basket of inflation. Obviously, that's another topic, uh, how you measure inflation. But long story short, what they believe is by increasing and decreasing the number of units of the, of the token that they print, they can change the behavior of, of the market to whether... Uh, they would spend it or save it. And that's absolutely flawed because the psychology of the market is a natural phenomenon. It's not based on uh, a switch that you can turn on and off because humans are apparently not robots. They have desires. They, have, uh, they make choices on a daily Spend basis. Them, Yes, they have sentiment. sentiment, exactly. So once you, sentiment is the right word, exactly. So what happens is once you switch that sentiment to spending, it is almost impossible to reverse that. You can, you can, you can increase interest rates, but uh, that's going to that's gonna make things worse because that's not going to change much. I mean, people are going to burn down the, the, the Federal Reserve probably if, if they would really want to fight inflation right now if they really want to do that, inflation right now by their own measures is how much? 7% in the US, Sina? 6%, 7%, 8%? No, it was 8.3. 8.3%. So if they really wanted to fight that, they would actually have to increase interest rates to 9%, right? Mathematically speaking. But obviously they cannot do that. So instead... They're trying to tame this. They're trying to um, put a wording into the sentiment that we are going to do everything we can in order to fight inflation. But the problem is that's just, you know, they're playing with fire. That's the problem because human psychology is, is, is uncontrollable. Once that changes, you cannot reverse it. It's very hard to reverse. Exactly. 
the inflationary expectation based on behavior, behavioral economics. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, the point is all this velocity comes from an unsupported monetary system, printing money, speculation, which caused a bubble and led to an unproductive economy. So uh, uh, this fragile system, um, it, I mean, um, velocity is uh, an, an inevitable feature of that unproductive economy. Sina, what do you think? Uh, for example, uh, for, yeah, I mean, for example, if we had a free market system, um, hopefully one day with a Bitcoin standard, uh, last year, as we saw, you know, shortage of products and potential for inflation rising, you would see that a lot of the private institutions, private lending institutions would raise their interest rates automatically because uh, they didn't want to fund um, economic activity when raw materials are short and when there is uh, uh, too much too much liquidity around, right? So this would have been taken care of on its own, but now we have Federal Reserve System that that you know uses modeling and they have all kinds of sophisticated models, lots of you know economics PhDs and many branches in the country and lots of uh, money behind it, trying to model and predict inflation. And uh, I recall Jerome Powell's comment that said, if you put in any kind of uh, quantitative easing policy in our models, none of that would have gotten you this level of inflation. So they kind of, none of their models really worked. And, and now they are basically trying to use uh, psychological tools, as you said, uh, to gain back, you know, trying to slow down the market without actually having to um, yes. crash, crash liquidity and crash the economy, which is, of course, impossible. The only way you can slow down inflation is by creating a crash, um, which uh, destroys demand, right? So... Uh, this is all a game, uh, as you said, a very dangerous game they're playing. And it's, it's basically a farce and a theater to show that we are fighting inflation. And of course, as soon as it's kind of a little bit uh, tamed and uh, you start to see economic slowdown around the world, uh, we are already seeing that, then uh, we will see the narrative change and suddenly inflation would not be a problem. Actually, at that point, you will start seeing a lot of headlines talking about recession and layoffs. And that's something, oh, we can never tolerate that. So, of course, Federal Reserve will come to the rescue. And uh, we, these wise economists with models will always be there to support us. So at that point, it's much more important to uh, g ensure people keep their jobs rather than trying to reduce inflation. So, um, uh, that's how this theater will end. Yeah. Um, I see we have a couple of people, 23, precisely 22 people in the room right now. If anyone has a question, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, I'm going to bring you up and you can ask your question. If you're listening to this on a podcast app, uh, we do these rooms on a weekly basis. So every Friday we do two rooms. One room is in Persian. One room is in English. So uh, if you want to ask us questions uh, live, you can participate in these podcast sessions on our uh, Clubhouse Club named BitGuide. And uh, you're more than welcome to ask us direct questions in the chat or even in the room uh, directly. Uh, but other than that, I think we've covered pretty much everything we wanted to talk about Sina it's already been over an hour um, if I don't see any more hands up in the room I would say that we can actually wrap it up um, and talk a little bit about the courses and close the room so the only thing so, I'll mention is like if you want to take away one thing from this session is uh, we have significant 
signs and signals showing that the financial markets are very, very fragile, right? And fragile is a keyword for volatility. So you should expect, you know, violent moves to either side. That's that's a real possibility now. Of course, it doesn't mean it's, it will happen, but it's just much more likely at this point. And to be, we will keep tracking uh, the economy and the economic metrics to see uh, where we are going, but uh, we are at the moment the way the way it looks, we're not going to anywhere anywhere good. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyone who is interested, we have a website named bitguide.io. We publish regular courses about microeconomics, about Bitcoin, about self custody of Bitcoin, and uh, if you are interested, just check out our website and register and whenever we have new courses you are going to be able to participate and you're going to also receive um, a badge where you have earned your your degree in some sort um so bitguide is uh, is 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 the only and first bitcoin open university you can earn your degree in, 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 in BitGuide. There's already one course that uh, Sina has created and curated where you will learn about the sources of money, history of money. That's the first course. Um, I'm working right now on a course about self-custody, what it means, uh, how it should be done, and so on and so forth. And uh, yeah, more is coming. Follow us on Clubhouse. Uh, Icarus, I want to really thank you for participating, taking the time to participate in both rooms, to contribute your knowledge. Uh, it's highly appreciated. I want to thank you again for coming and joining us. It was my real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, you now. Uh, and I and you guys keep going. Let's say way to go, guys. Thank you for all the contribution. For sure. Thank you so much. Sina, any last words? Uh, no, just thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to everyone who joined and who spoke. Uh, we'll see you next week. In the meantime, check out our, our website. Thank you, everyone. Take care.